So welcome to the, uh, the third lecture. Um, so we're going to accomplish um, <clears throat> two things in this lecture. Um, we're going to uh, continue uh, and complete where we were with the French Revolution, add a few things and complete that. So in terms of our mixture of theory and evidence, we'll, today we're going to start with some evidence. Um, there'll be a little theory mixed in in this first hour. And then in the second hour, we're going to talk about uh, everything we're going to need to know about bond prices and government budget constraints in order to interpret the data that are going to appear throughout this class. So that's where we're going. Um, and um, so let's just get started. Um, so here goes. Um, so I'm going to show you. A, I'm going to start by showing you a graph, um, which relates to what we were talking about last time. This is, this is a history of the price level under under the gold and silver standard from 1600 to 1900. Um, for uh, actually, there's there's uh, three or four countries there. I'll show you the countries in a minute. And that graph goes from 1600. Actually, stops in 1913. Um, so that was that was what was achieved when we were there, either on monometallism or bimetallism. Um, it's in a, it's in a log scale. Uh, we don't really need a log scale. Here. So, this is the quote from David Ricardo that we saw last time in 1860, which is about right here. Now, it's interesting, it's right here because um, this red line is France. And this episode right here, we're going to talk about today. Um, but in 1860, uh, David Ricardo um, recommended that you do a trick, which is basically you stay on a commodity money, but you issue the minimum amount of commodity money and the maximum amount of tokens that's consistent with staying on the, the uh, gold standard. So he was, he was recommending um, issuing Okay, so there's a warning about token money, and this was in our proposition. This was inherent in one of our propositions. It was the second regime, the second region of the parameter space where you had issued so much paper money that there's going to be no silver circulating, and uh, you're on an irredeemable money, paper money standard. And what Irving Fisher warned in 1911, he has this quote, which is one of Milton Friedman's favorite quotes, by the way. Irredeemable paper money has almost invariably proved a curse to the country employing it. That's Irving Fisher's warning in 1911. So here, that's, that, that warning is issued right here. And this is a history of prices log pricing um, after 1914 that break is in 1914 um, which is world war one um, actually if somebody has their uh video or, or their audio on and it's giving us this noise maybe just turn off the audio great okay so what you'll see is this is a manifestation of Irving Fisher's curse. Um, these are the hard currency countries in the world, and um, the promise of a your, the promise of a token money. Um, it's taken a long time, to say the least, to deliver the same level of price stability. Um, so, here's going to be the outline of today's talk. We're going to talk about. Um, monetary uh, fiscal budget arithmetic 
and we're going to talk about the, the dependence or the independence of monetary and fiscal authorities. We're going to talk about theory and evidence about inflation. I'm going to tell you, we told you a little bit about the quantity theory of money last time. I'm going to mention something called the real bills doctrine, um, which is very old and also very modern. And then uh, I'll talk about the coordination of monetary and fiscal policy of the, to beginning. And I'm going to talk, uh, as I said, about the independence of monetary policy. So a couple, a couple of lines about, we're going to talk about inflation, which if you're from Europe, or Western Europe today, or um, the United States, inflation is not viewed as a problem. Um, but it was pretty recently. It was until basically the mid 1990s in the United States. And it, it's, it is now a problem in countries like Argentina and Brazil. Um, and some other countries. So what Milton Friedman said is, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Um, we'll see what he means. It's a very famous quote. Um, so that's one cause. But here's another quote. This is something you know, my friend Neil Wasson said, inflation is always and everywhere a fiscal phenomenon. So we're gonna spend some time today and in subsequent lectures, uh, Wrestling with this. Okay, so here's the reconciliation. How can you? How can these? These are both true. These are both true. So how can we reconcile them? So the the answer is that without a disciplined fiscal policy, it's just not feasible to run a non-inflationary monetary policy. But with a disciplined fiscal policy, it's easy to run a non-inflation non monetary policy. That's what some basic budget arithmetic is going to tell us. And um, we're going to see this. We're going to see this as a theme uh, throughout the course. Okay. So here's going to be some objects in place. So again, what we're going to do is we're going to this is. This is going to be directed at contrasting this graph, which is before 1914, when we basically had stable prices in a, in a number of hard currency countries, with this graph, after 1914, um, we had a lot of inflation. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to have two versions of government budget constraints. So the objects in play are going to be these. These are going to be the, the players. It's going to be G is, a, is going to be a sequence, is going to be government expenditures, purchases. Um, they're not going to include interest payments. Just one second. Okay, so here we go. Um, so we'll just return to this. So the objects in play are gonna be government expenditures is G, total tax collections. A government total, those, that's total government expenditures except for one thing, um, service of the government debt. So we're gonna account for that differently. Um, TT is total tax collections. BT is government debt. And this government debt, we're going to do, this is going to be a simple version, very, very simple model. It's going to be indexed government debt. So it's going to be inflation indexed. It's going to be one period government debt. So we're just going to have only one period risk-free bonds. We're going to come back to that later today. RT is a, a real one period net interest rate. And PT is the price level. Those are the things in play. Okay, so those are the objects. Uh, and notice I'm not, I do not have money in there. Because before 1914, to a, to a good approximation, the government is not gonna be issuing money to finance its budget in normal times. Um, 
again, this is a simplification, but it's pretty good approximation. After 1914, it's going to be exactly the same things. These are all the same things. But now we're going to have MT is going to be in play, and that's going to be a stock of fiat money. So my vision is before 1914, we're basically on the gold standard. After 1914, it's a complicated story. We left the gold standard in various steps. Okay. So here's the government budget constraint before 1914. Um, on the left-hand side is going to be government, government expenditures. So G is government expenditures. R, that's the interest payments on the government debt. On the right-hand side is going to be tax collections. And then the first difference in government debt. So you come into a period, the government has to pay this. It has two ways to pay it. It can tax or it can increase borrowing. That's the government budget constraint. Now, this is a difference equation. We're going to view this as a difference equation in the stock of government debt. And we're going to look at it a couple ways. Um, so a difference equation is a, is a, it's a sequence of equations. This is going to hold for every T, T equals zero, one, two. Actually, it could solve, it could actually be hold for, for, for negative, negative two going back to some initial condition. Um, if we solve the, if we view this as just a difference equation to be solved for, for B, it's a function of stuff that happened in the past. It looks like this. Uh, government debt today is equal to government debt yesterday times one plus the interest rate. And if the interest rate's positive, this is a number greater than one. So it's government debt is equal to government debt yesterday times a number greater than one plus the government debt net of interest deficit today. This is the net of interest deficit. It's what the IMF calls the primary deficit or the operational deficit. Um, the IMF would call this they would call that the gross of interest deficit. So the punchline of this, what this little equation says, it's basic arithmetic. If, if R is positive and G minus T is positive, then debt's growing, it's heading north. And uh, in our little model, it can't go north forever. There's gonna be some terminal condition or boundary condition that says there's gonna be some upper bound on the amount of debt that can be issued. If you're an American citizen, or I guess if you're one of the two presidential candidates, you're not very aware of this. You pretend like you're not aware of this today, but if you're from um, Argentina or, uh, or Brazil, you're aware of it. Okay, so again, this is a difference equation, and you can solve a difference equation either backwards or forwards. Um, you could ask which is true. Uh, they're both true. They're different characterizations. Um, this tells you how past stuff got us to where we are today. What this is going to tell us is we're going to take the same difference equation and we're actually going to view it as something like a, my friend John Cochran calls it an asset pricing equation. Um, it looks like one. We're going to take the same difference equation and we're going to solve it forward. Um, we're going to, we're going to solve for BT minus one. It's a function of BT, TT, and GT. And we're going to solve for BT as a function of TT plus 1, BT plus 2, and so on. We're just going to go forward like that. If we solve that forward and we iterate, we get this equation, which is a really important equation. It says that the current value of gov government debt is a discounted present value of government surpluses. This is a government surplus.
So what this equation back here told you is you have high government debt today if you had big government deficits in the past. What this equation tells you, if you have high government debt today, it's a, and, and I'm assuming this debt's risk-free, it's a signal that you're gonna have surpluses tomorrow. And the present value of those surpluses is gonna equal the, the value of the debt. And in this little simple model, this is just a discount factor. It's one plus, one over one plus R raised to the J. So this is a number that's less than one. This whole number is less than one. Um, so th this is trailing off these because of this J. But the key, the key thing is government debt signals future government surpluses. So by the way, I'm gonna um, have some fun um, problems that I'm gonna hand out. Um, you know, one, one problem I should, could say is, you're an advisor to um, Mrs. Clinton or Donald Trump, and, 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 and that person has heard that government debt signal future government surpluses. How could that possibly be? Explain it to them. That's the kind of problem I, I, I would feel free to ask you. Okay, so government budget, so that's all before 1914. Now, after 1914, the government got a, an additional tool. Another way to, a way to say it, if you're from Brazil, uh, you know this. The additional tool is, here we are, government budget constraint, that's what you spend. As your interest, you have to have that interest even if you want to roll over your debt. How can you finance this? Well, those are taxes. You can borrow more in interest-bearing form, or there's this other term. And we'll check the units of this. MT has the units of dollars, and PT has the units of dollars per unit consumption good. So if we, we divide M over P, we just get consumption goods. So M over P is real balances. And what's happening here is the government is, this is the amount, M T minus one is the amount of money people brought into the period. The government just prints up some more money. And what does it use it for? It's gonna use it to cover, um, well, if it's issuing in a positive amount, See, this amount could be, this amount could be either positive or it could be negative. It's gonna be positive if, if uh, it's, it's just gonna be, you know, you know, what's it gonna be? We we'll just write this equation like this. This is trivial, but useful. So money's either gonna be money's either gonna be growing or decreasing depending on what these terms look like. That's what the government budget constraint says. Now Milton Friedman actually said this should be negative at a certain rate. We're, we're gonna we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. So this is a so-called consolidated government budget constraint. consolidated, meaning it consolidates the budget constraint of the Treasury or the Department of Finance with the Central Bank or the Federal Reserve. Okay. So if we take this budget constraint and we solve it backwards, we're just going to get this equation. It looks just like the equation that we had before, except we have essentially we have an additional, um, this, this is actually looks like, it looks like a source of revenues. So it's, it's gonna be intimately related to what we're gonna call an inflation tax. Okay, again, we can solve this equation forward. And now we get something interesting. Um, 
we just solve the same equation and we solve it forward as a difference equation. We get that the value of real index government debt is the present value of surpluses plus the present value of something else. And what this is, is this is the present value of revenues from printing money. So remember, I'm, I'm assuming um, in this little theory that government debt is indexed. It's denominated in consumption goods. So it's, it, would it would be what the United States calls TIPS, inflation-protected um, treasury securities. Um, there are other countries, Brazil and Argentina issued those in the, Argentina, Brazil issued them um, in an important way in the eight, 1980s when they had big inflation. Um, so now government debt is signaling either future government surpluses or, and or future money creation and inflation. So when you, you've heard people say big government debt now um, threatens to generate inflation in the future, well, this is the arithmetic that's at the heart of their argument. Okay. Okay, so now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over the following quickly, I think. Um, I'm going to take, take exactly this equation, and I'll impose a steady state. So let me tell you what we mean by a steady state. I'm just going to do the following. I'm going to set GT equal G. I'm going to set TT equal to T. I'm going to set BT plus 1 equal to BT equal to B. So I'm just going to roll over the debt. Okay, now what am I going to do about M? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set um, I'm going to do the following. I'm going to set the price level. I'm going to do this. So kind of like what's a steady state if there's inflation? I'm going to, I want a steady state inflation rate. So what this is going to look like is this. I'm going to let this be 1 plus pi times pt. So what pi is going to be, it's going to be a net inflation rate. It's going to be positive. It's going to be, it's going to be positive if, price, if uh, inflation is... Uh, Prices are going up and it's going to be negative. Prices are going down. Milton Friedman, by the way, said it should be negative. So in, 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 a, in a very famous piece of work that we're going to see, um, which puzzles a lot of people, he, his, his argument was deflation in Europe, is that a problem? Is that a problem the central bank should be worried about? He would say that alone is a symptom, is, is a, an outcome that would be desirable. He, you'd have to go and find out is it's being generated the way he wanted it to be generated, but that's another issue. But just that symptom um, might be a good thing, might be bad. So if we take that, um, and we're gonna do a little calculation like this. We're gonna, we're gonna posit, we're gonna posit, remember what, what did we do last time? Uh, last time we had a demand function for money uh, that looked like this. Um, Last time we had our demand function for money looked like this. When we, we used the very simplest, I call it the Cambridge K theory. Um, it looked like this. Um, the amount of money people wanted to carry in the next period, I said that was just equal K times C. What we're going to do this time is we're going to say, well, K is actually, K is not a constant. And if you're... If your parents lived through the uh, hyperinflation in Brazil, um, or your grandparents, great grandparents lived through the one in Germany or Hungary, uh, you know the following: um, real balances aren't a constant; they weren't a constant. Demand for real balances shrunk as inflation increased. So, what people substitute for this is we're going to say this is actually a function of pi, the steady state rate of inflation, and in particular. F prime is negative. So we have in mind a graph that looks like this. 
Here's the real balances, here's inflation, and here's the demand for real balances. This is the demand for real balances. And last time we just said, um, that was just K. But now we're saying, no, it's not. It looks like this. It's F of pi. And when inflation goes up, people economize on their holdings of real balances. Okay? So in that case, um, the government budget constraint in, in a steady state becomes, well, this. This is just, um, I've just manipulated the, the government budget constraint. Um, it's easy to do. I might do, I might, I'm, I'm gonna give that as an exercise. Um, I'll fill in enough. Essentially what we do is we did the following. Here's the start of the exercise. Okay, we're gonna do that. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going. Um, and then I'm gonna do some more things. Um, okay, so in a steady state, um, here's what's happening. Um, the equations look something like this. Um, real money balances, we're gonna view that as a base of an inflation tax. And we're gonna view pi as the rate of the inflation tax. And if we take this equation, um, this equation uh, says that there exists uh, what's called a Laffer curve in the inflation tax rate. And, and the way this goes is it goes like this. I've left, um, I've left a, I'm gonna go like this. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Okay, here's what goes. What pi is the inflation rate. Oops, sorry. And I'm gonna draw this like, oops, I don't know how that happened. Okay, I'm gonna draw this like this. Pi is the inflation track. And on this graph, I'm gonna put G minus T plus RB. What's that? That's the um, gross of interest government deficit. And um, what I'm going to put here, so that with a, in a steady state, that's just going to be a constant line. It's not going to depend on pi. And then what I'm going to plot here is I'm going to plot a curve that's going to be f of pi times pi. That's going to be the revenue from the inflation tax. And um, it's going to look like this. Um, it's, it's going to it's going to be for low pi. Um, it's going to be increasing. For high pi, it's going to be decreasing. And the reason it's going to be decreasing is when pi gets really high, even though this is going up, this is going down at such a rate um, that it it makes the the total go up, to go down. Um, so, so this thing is called f of pi times pi. This is a so-called Laffer curve, um, which is the inflation tax revenues. So this is inflation tax revenues. We're going to see this again. And this is, um, this is these are the needs for the inflation tax. So. What you'll notice is a steady state is going to be a, it's going to be the government expenditures finance. So it turns out there's two steady states. There's going to be, um, so we're going to come back to this. Um, I want to show you a, a more careful version of this later. Okay. So, um, I'm now going to go back and with this is a, okay, so I'm going to give a lecture that's all about this and some other things in more detail in a couple of weeks. Um, 
but I just want to put some of these on the table and we'll come back to them. Okay. So don't, don't worry about this slide right now. Um, okay. Okay. So here, I, here's the tax. I'm going to go back to the French revolution. I, I told you they had some very sophisticated, sophisticated economic advisors. Here's one. And this was Barrow tax moving, uh, Gallatin tax moving way before Barrow. This was, uh, a very succinct definition of credible policy that we talked about. Um, okay, I have to tell you one more thing. Um, and we saw a little bit about this last time. Um, Adam Smith in his Wealth of Nations, um, it's a fascinating book. Um, the book is, the book is an attack on, it's an attack on mercantilism. It's an attack on restrictions on international trade. And a big part of Adam Smith's attack on mercantilism consisted of a recommendation for a banking reform, a fast banking reform. And here's the reason for that. Um, it's a little bit of a digression, but it, it relates to things we're going to see in the French Revolution. Um, because the people who where legislators during the French Revolution had read and thought about Adam Smith's argument, and they bought the argument that they wanted to dismantle restrictions on trade. They were very influenced by him. And they would actually say that Adam Smith was influenced by, by French economists. There's a lot of truth to that. So part of Smith's attack on mercantilism had to be a response to the following. Defenders of mercantilism had as an important part of their argument that restrictions on trade protected the domestic money supply from instability. And if you were on a gold and silver standard, as you were in the day, it prevented big disruptions to the domestic money market. Because if you had shocks that caused um, big even if it was temporary balance of payments deficit that required an outflow of money that disrupted the domestic money market. And this is, this is actually Adam Smith's characterization of the best argument he could put forward to, to uh, mercantilism. So what Smith argued was, um, that what you could do is, and we talked about this last time, you could, if you were a small open economy, as he thought Britain was, if commercial banks issued notes, their token notes, now he wanted them to be convertible into gold on demand. So he imagined that there was a bank um, that instead of, uh, was just a warehouse certificate for holding gold, it issued notes um, it had a small gold reserve, but on the, on the asset side of its balance sheet was very safe short-term commercial loans. So actually, we're going to see this, we're going to see this in our history. If, if, if we get to, if there's a bank balance sheet, we have 100% reserves, and that's something that was advocated well, by some Americans and by some British people, that's called 100% reserve banking. It's called narrow banking. Um, if we have this, um, just a second. Okay, forgive me. I can't figure out how to turn off the volume. I never get phone calls. Okay, so if we have 100% reserve banking, the asset side is gold, and the liability side is notes. Um, so this is, so that's, that's what some 100% um, reserves. What Adam Smith wanted to do was, he's going to replace that the assets and the liabilities are going to look like this. The assets are going to be, instead, they're going to be a small reserve of gold, 
and a big uh, reserve of what he's going to call real bills. And what those are are their loans to merchants that are going to be paid off. There might be they might be a bills of exchange, um, and the bank is going to issue money, um, which you could call them tokens if you want, but they're IOUs that are safe evidences of indebtedness. And what Adam Smith said, we did a little version of this last week. He said that um, if this was done right, it would leave the price level unaffected. It would, these would be as good as gold. They would be fully backed circulated notes. They would be um, issued by private notes or central banks. Um, and he said, it was an argument very similar to what we had last week. He said this would make welfare better off because you would, you, instead of using a valuable resource like gold as money or lock it up in the coffers of a bank that issued notes that were 100% backed by money, he said gold could flow out of the country um, and you could import uh, consumption goods and you'd have, a, you'd have what he called, uh, you'd have a, con a consumption boon. So that's Adam Smith's doctrine. Um, so what? So he has this line. So Adam. So it's interesting. Adam Smith. This was way before um, modern probability theory was in the shape it was. And it, well, there's not much knowledge. There's not much indication Adam Smith knew much about um, probability theory, such as it was then. So he's he's what he calls this real bills. It's a famous term. He says. He, he, look what he says. He says a real bill of exchange is drawn by a real creditor on a real debtor, and as soon as it becomes paid, it's really paid. He's using the word real um, three times to define a real bill. So what he really means is risk-free. It's not fraudulent. There really is a creditor. There's really a debtor. Okay. So that's what he wants his banks to do, and he says that's... Um, the role in terms of mercantilism, he said, you don't need gold and silver. You could have no gold and silver in your country or very little. Um, you don't have to worry about it going out as long as you have banks that are doing this. So this is a, this is a, occupies a um, good fraction, you know, maybe a, a fifth of the wealth of nations is about this doctrine. Okay. So there we go. So if we, if we go to another famous economist, John Stuart Mill, um, he's on to the circle of ideas that we, we've just been talking about. He says the issues. Of, he says the issues of a government paper. That means government money, um, money issued by a central bank, even if it's not permanent, even when uh, not permanent, will raise prices. And why will it raise prices? He says because its governments usually issue their paper money in purchases for consumption, government consumption. That's what he says. So he has in mind, actually, the French Revolution. But he says, if, if it's issued to pay off a portion of the national debt, he says it will have no effect. So what he's saying is an open market operation. Is irrelevant, has no effect. So if we go back to our government budget constraint, we have this here in our little theory. Just come back here. Um, let's go all the way back to here. Um, we could issue this money and use it to pay, in, issue this money and we use it to, we, we drive this up and the reason we do it is we use it to, 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 to pay for this. But what we could have done is we could have increased this, increased this, but it, and what do we use it for? We use it to retire this. So we freeze the left-hand side, we increase money, but we decrease bonds. That's an open market operation. And what, what John Stuart Mill is telling us is that has a very different effect. Those two things have very different effects. So it matters what the government is, um, is using the money for. And I had a discussion with one of you last night about um, this in the context of Japan. And um, we'll come back to this. Okay. So 
And now with all this machinery, I'm going to just show you some stuff about uh, 1789 to 1799. And I'm going to interpret it as kind of uh, an early real bills experiment. Not quite, but, but close. Okay, so, uh, so I told you about the fiscal crisis of 1788, 1789 and what led to it. And I told you I had gotten to the point where the National Assembly nationalized, nationalized church lands. And I started telling you about what it did with those church lands. These weren't, these people who nationalized this land weren't Bolsheviks. They were, they were free market people um, that were interested in an expedient way of, they, they were, they were anti-clerical, obviously, didn't value their clergy very much. And they were concerned to, to issue, to, to finance government, finance the credit of the French government. They, they didn't, they were redistributing from the church to the creditors of the government. That's what they wanted to do. They didn't want to, they weren't nationalizing everybody. They were nationalizing some people to help some other people. Um, and then they, so We'll talk. We'll talk about this. We're going to talk about this exit strategy. How you exit? They had a. They had a strategy when they issued its astronauts that they were going to retire them. In the last few years, we've heard about what's the Fed or the central, or the ECB's exit strategy from all the, all the uh, currency and reserves it's issued. So they had an exit strategy, but it broke down, and I'm going to have to tell you how it broke down. And this experiment got um, got changed. And there's going to be a theme here. Um, you have a note, you know, with somebody's picture on it, you know, some guy. Um, you have some note, and that note can say something. But the kind of theory that Adam Smith has, and that's going to be present in this, um, in this little historical example, is you can't just look at this note. You have to look at the balance sheet of the bank or really the consolidated balance sheet of the bank and the government, figure out what the backing of this note is. Is this really backed by something? And what's it backed by? Um, that's going to be the theme of this. So here's our graph for 18th century Britain. This is a striking graph, again. You know, what's striking about it is tax moving. Government expenditures are, are variable. They're very variable during wars, but tax revenues are much smoother. Um, okay, um, France was different. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you some pictures, bring some of this to life. Um, okay, uh, see this person, that's Louis the Sixteenth, um, King of France. Um, that's, France was on the gold standard, and they issued coins like that. Um, if you were a French citizen, um, you knew what your king looked like. Um, and the reason is, if you were lucky enough, you might have seen one of these coins. That's how you, that's how you know what you look like. Okay. So um, what, the, what France did after it nationalized the church lands is it issued these things. And if you read French, um, oh, look, that same guy, there's all the racist because it's too beautiful. There's Louis the Sixteenth there, right there. Now a lot of people had seen this. A lot of people had seen this, and um, I'll tell you a story. Um, Louis the Sixteenth, um, things got bad for Louis the Sixteenth, and um, he was arrested and put in jail. Um, and in 1792, he was in jail, and he uh, he, he knew he was in danger, so he uh, he arranged an escape. He got dressed up as a woman, and um, and got in a uh, he with a small number of people in a in a uh, carriage. He went to the French border, and right before he got to the French border, um, somebody um, who had had some of these notes recognized that there was an ugly woman um, that looked very much like the king, and he reported. So he was arrested and taken back to Car to uh, Paris. Um, but the, re the only reason they knew him was because his picture was on this. Um, what these pieces, these are pieces of paper. Um, 
And what they do is, you, you see when it was issued, it was in, issued early in April 1790. And um, um, I did not do well in high school French, but what this thing says is the owner of this, it's denominated in leaves. Um, this is a 50 leave note. Um, you can take this piece of paper and you can use it at an auction. It'll be, it'll be redeemable. One, it's as good as silver at a, or, or gold at a auction of church lands. So you can take these. So what the French government does, it's just going to issue these things. It's going to pay its creditors. Uh, it's going to hold a church. It's going to pay its creditors and employees. Um, it's going to hold the auction. Um, the land is then going to, there's going to be a legal document. The land's no longer the national government's. It belongs to whoever bought it. And then it's going to take these things and it's going to burn them. Um, that, that's the experiment. Okay, so, so here's what happened. Um, so it's just a striking picture. So they start issuing these uh, in early 1790, and they, they start issuing them, issuing them, issuing them. And this is the total issue here. It goes up. Okay. And um, there's estimates of, I should have put this on. And, and so what they, after they issue them, it takes the time to go. They start, um, they start using this to, um, uh, you know, they, during this period right in here, um, they're issuing them faster than they're burning them. They are holding these church auctions. Um, what they're also doing is, as they issue them, they're, um, they're paying off. During this period, they're, they're actually, they're using these things to um, retire um, government debt. So they're, they're the beneficiary of these issues, so they, they, they issue them, um, and they're paying off their creditors. So government debt, uh, interest-bearing debt's going down until around right here. Look what happens here. Um, they stop paying off their creditors, and um, this thing keeps going north. It's going to go uh, north a lot higher. Um, something happened here. And um, what's happening here is um, they, they're basically stopping the auctions here. The auctions are stopping around there, but they keep printing the money. They keep printing the money. So this thing, and it looks, the things they print after that looks just like this, except now you can't use these to go and buy church land. Okay, what can you use them for? Well, um, we'll show you. You can, uh, we'll get to that in a minute. So, so here's what happens. Um, um, this is the history of the price level. Um, so what Adam Smith told you is if you did something like this, um, so that what this graph is going to record is it's got several things. Um, it's got, it's got a price level. It's, it's in the logs. Um, during this early period, um, right in here, um, this, this scheme is working uh, quite well. They get a little bit of, they get some inflation, um, but they're printing, you notice they're printing, uh, actually, I'm a little wrong. This auction stopped kind of over here. Um, they're, they're printing um, money. They're using, it, they're using it to finance um, the government. They're using it to pay off creditors, and they're holding these auctions. And then what happens right in here is uh, a, a European war breaks out. Um, and um, France basically goes to war with all of its neighbors. Um, and it, um, it uh, because of various things in the revolution, it has, it has actually dismantled much of its tax collection system. Um, and... Uh, so T has gone down. Um, it's declared all sorts of ancient taxes illegal, and it's set up a new, it's in the course of designing a new tax administration, new tax laws, but they haven't gone in. So its abilities to raise revenue has gone way down. They get attacked, um, and, they, and they're losing the war. Um, 
and they have one way to uh, get revenues and it's, um, it's the printing press. And so they use it. And, um, and they're doing badly. And so what happens here is there's some political, there's some political events in here. So if you go, if you go read, uh, the, there's the Girondines and there's the Jacobins. And, um, and in this period, uh, the Girondines are, they're free market guys who have a limited, uh, a limited tolerance for violence. The Jacobins are willing to do anything to, to save the state. So what happens is the government is printing a lot of money uh, in this period, and there's an incipient hyperinflation. During this period, right here, look at this period, that's when prices really start taking off. Remember, that's a log scale. They start taking off until right here. And then suddenly they start going down. And during this period, um, between this, this early period and a later period, government expenditures rise by a factor of four or five. There's a huge increase in government expenditures. And the government has basically one way to finance them, it's to print money. So what happens during the terror is um, all sorts of legal restrictions are put in place. Um, that's what the Jacobins do. So they say uh, they have a way to finance the revolution, uh, to, to finance the war. And here's what they do. They're going to close down um, stock market, bond market. They're going to make it illegal to uh, hoard inventories. They're going to make it so that um, that anything that's a substitute for currency um, is illegal to hold. They're going to impose wage and price controls. And they're going to enforce these restrictions um, with the guillotine. So if you, uh, if you uh, are caught hoarding gold or caught holding inventories, or they shut down the stock market, they shut down, a, if you're caught trading those things, you're, um, they kill about two dozen people. And um, that's quite enough to, uh, to enforce this. So what happens is, this is an unheard of thing here. During this period, um, the government is printing money at a very high rate, this period right here, during the terror. They're printing money like anything, and prices are going down. So what they've done is, we'll talk about this theory, they, are, they have discovered the legal restrictions theory of the demand for money of John Maynard Keynes and Neil Wallace. They've done things to push. Remember, what's the revenue from inflation? It's F of pi, that's the demand for real money, times basically inflation. And what they've done is they've pushed um, the demand for money way out to the right. They pushed it way out to the right by these legal restrictions and the guillotine. Okay, so fine. And so what happens is during this period, there's a terrible war going on during this period. France is printing money. Uh, they're printing money, but the price level is going down. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a state with a lot of uh, using terror as an instrument of economic policy. Um, but what happens is, um, and their French are, citizens are patriotic because they realize that these measures, there's a big enough coalition to support these measures because they know that this is the only way they can finance the they can finance the war. Um, the whole revolution is, uh, is, is at stake. And what happens here is during this period, gradually during this period, France starts winning the war. Over this period, they start winning the war. Um, and toward the middle of 1794, um, the threat to the nation has, has gone away as a result of these battlefield victories. Government's still printing up out a lot of money. That's its main finance. But now what happens is, oh, by the way, all during this period, all during this period, France is paying its creditors. It's not defaulting on its creditors. Um, it's not so, that's significant if you, if you compare it with the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. Um, you know, in some ways, the creditors of the government before 1789 have taken over the French state and they want to get paid. So during this period, France, Francis, uh, Francis Vic gets to be victorious and, and something happens that's really bad for the Jacobins. The, 
the political coalition, the support for this, uh, these dire measures evaporates. And very quickly, between June and July 1794, the support evaporates and Robespierre, uh, perhaps the most famous Jacobin, is, it, is literally at the top of his power in May um, 16, uh, 1794, uh, and he's, um, he's sending people to guillotine. Um, in July 1794, he is sent to the guillotine. And, in, and as he's sent to the guillotine, the crowd um, says, uh, in, they say vul, in, in a vulgar term that I can't say here, they say, um, this means that the laws of the wage and price controls are no longer going to be enforced. And they stopped being enforced almost instantaneously when, when he went to the guillotine. And now what happens is uh, the demand from, uh, for money uh, shrinks, and now you start getting an open-ended classical hyperinflation. Um, and um, that continues until uh, 1796, and it's ended. It's ended, um, France has, has done well in the war. It, it's ended when, France is issuing huge amounts of paper money here. It's ended when um, France decides it's going to um, default on two thirds of its debt. And when it defaults on two thirds of its debt, it drives its government expenditures way down. And then for it, um, a couple of years later, uh, 1799, someone named Napoleon Bonaparte um, takes over, and he is a balanced budget man. He has a different way. He's not going to. He's not going to issue paper money, and he's going to issue. He's going to raise revenues by um, by making uh, other countries um, pay. Okay. So, so, so here's what happens. There's one picture. Here's what happens to the real value. Here's what happens to the real value of government, um, of the real value of assignats. So these are, these are basically assignats divided by the price level. So during this early period, look what's happening. When they're issuing lots of these assignats, the real value of these assignats is actually increasing. Um, this, I think of this as the Adam Smith um, period. Um, you know, this is actually put in operation. Um, this paper money is, is, being, is being used to substitute for gold and silver, and it's kind of working. Where is this gold and silver working? A lot of it flows into England. England, England has a big inflow of gold. And then it's starting to work until just this period, um, when France is losing the war and printing lots of money. Um, you get an incipient classical situation when you print a lot of money, real balances go down. And that's what happens when the terror ends. You're printing a lot of money. Um, as inflation rises, um, the real value of, uh, of the currency assignat decreases. And you'll notice it starts high when the terror, it vanishes to almost, to almost nothing. Um, so this is a classical hyperinflation. That's the way I think of it. It's one of the first ones. If you're, if you're, we have one, is, is it, there's other examples of this from hyperinflation Germany, hyperinflation Austria. Um, this is the period of the terror. Um, and uh, they did things to shift the demand for money. So if we kind of draw some pictures here, um, um, so here's what's going on. These, these red ones, these, these, uh, these dots here, I draw this during the during the uh, the period of real bills experiment. Kind of looks like this. I'm just gonna. They just increase the the um, and not until the very end do you get much increase in inflation. So this is a period when real balances are just increasing. That's what's going on here. And this period at the end is is right up here. Those dots. And then what happens? What's going on with the terror? So these are, that's the real bills. So what am I plotting here? Real balances here and inflation here. That's real bills. What are the, these things, these dots? Those are the terror or the Neil Wallace legal restriction. What happens with the terror is 
you shift the demand for real balance way far to the right, look, look where that went. They went even farther, bigger real balances are being held than were even held under the Adam Smith regime. That's what the guillotine will do to you. It's not the rate of return. It's, it's um, punishment. This increases way to the right. Um, and inflation doesn't go up very much at all. It actually goes down. Look at this. These are big negative inflation rates. That's, that's what we saw in this graph right in here. Okay. And then the final period, and if you're a student of hyperinflation, these stars, that's the classic hyperinflation. That's after the tear is over. That's these periods. This looks, fits like a glove. Well, this, these data are probably noisy, but you get increasing inflation and decreasing real balances. And that's what's being shown here. Okay, so um, that's the French Revolution. Um, what I'm going to do now is take a 10-minute break. <laughs>